afternoon and good evening. We're in this sort of liminal uh, space here. Um, it's good to see you. It's, uh, I love this turnout. Um, it should be uh, an interesting and exciting lecture that we're about to hear, so I'm really appreciative that you decided to join us tonight. This is the 10th Torstensen Lecture. The department began this tradition to honor the founder of the Department of Sociology, Joel Torstensen. At the same time that he was founding the Department of Sociology, he also founded the Department of Social Work. Two decades after doing that, in the mid-1960s, Joel Torstensen penned a piece titled The Liberal Arts College in the Modern Metropolis which is considered a seminal document for shaping Oxford's urban mission and for making the case for the creation of our Metro Urban Studies program. As a response to the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. 48 years ago, nearly to the day, Joel Torsonson and several colleagues founded an initiative called Crisis Colony, which later became the Metro Urban Studies term, or MUST, which was the first academic program of the Higher Education Consortium for Urban Affairs, or HECUA. Additionally, he created the Scandinavian Urban Studies term, or SUST, um, which is also considered an important program uh, of HECUA. So off campus and on, Pr Professor Torstensen had a profound impact on the college, having served it in our department with integrity and passion for three decades. Tonight's event is a chance for our department and for all of us to honor the legacy of Joel Torstensen. When the department conceived of the Torstensen Lecture Series, we saw it as an opportunity to highlight the creative and excellent work of our peers at nearby institutions, sociologists who are doing great things in the discipline and in or near the Twin Cities. Tonight, our Torstensen lecturer is Professor Elizabeth Raleigh. Sorry that I keep That's all right. I'm backstage view of what I do. Backstage, front stage, the backstage, 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 just a touch away. <laughs> <laughs> Liz Raleigh is an assistant professor of sociology at Carleton College. Her research focuses on transracial adoption examining issues such as the market aspects of transracial adoption patterns, the racial socialization of transracial adoptive households, and the heterogeneity of the adopted child population. <coughs> Her research has appeared in journals such as Sociological Perspectives, Social Science Quarterly, and Children and Youth Services Review. She's currently working on a book-length manuscript titled Chosen Children, transracial adoption, and the private adoption marketplace. Her passion for her field of study extends into the courses she developed on assisted reproductive technology and adoption, race and ethnicity, and the American family. In the classroom, she draws on her diverse experiences ranging from policy advocacy at the Massachusetts Legislative Children's Caucus, direct service work at domestic violence shelters, and research at the Harvard School of Public Health. She earned a PhD in sociology from the University of Pennsylvania and did her undergraduate work at Brown University. Her research has been supported by the Mellon Mays Foundation, the American Associa uh, Association of University Women, and the Fulbright Fellowship. Liz currently lives in Northfield with her husband and seven-year-old daughter. When not working on her research or teaching, she can be found at the local yoga studio. <laughs> <laughs> With that, please join me in welcoming Professor Liz Raleigh. Thank you. 
controls for a second and ask you to do some of the initial work for me. So what I'd like you to do is to just think about what comes to mind when you hear the word adoption. If you've got a notebook, you can write it down. If you've got a phone, that's fine, you can type it out. Just put it away after that part. But just think of the first five words that come to mind. If you've got a good memory, you can just list them in your head. Even if you have two or three, let's get started. Anyone want to share? You can just shout them out. We're a small group. Choice. Choice. Okay, thank you. Other ones? Opportunity. Opportunity. Thinking like sociologists. I like it. <laughs> what else? Identity crisis. Identity crisis. Other Privilege. Ones? Privilege. All right, so one of the things that's interesting, if anyone have words like children, you know, some of the things, you know, who are the members of the adoption triad? And the other part that, you know, many of you, and you can tell that this is a sophisticated sociological audience, and so I'm glad in that regard that um, my work will be a little bit easier tonight, is to think about this idea, too, of the workers, that who actually puts the adoptive family together. And so that's where I start. So this idea, you know, going on this sense of doing something, Weston Zimmerman, what can we learn from people who do adoption? And so for the longest time, adoption research was usually based on those of adoptive parents. It was oftentimes written by adoptive parents as well. And then to a lesser extent, adult adoptees and occasionally, occasionally birth parents. But we don't have a lot of research on adoption practitioners. And so that's one of the contributions that I'm trying to do in my research. And part of this is the idea of the adoption triad. And so in adoption parlance, usually what we have is this sense of there's the adoptee or the adoptive person, the birth parents, and then the adoptive parent or parents. And those are the three central members. But yet, thinking structurally, a little bit more sociologically, I'm very interested in who puts that triad together and what can we learn by going up the sense of a unit of analysis and looking at those who are actually involved in facilitating the adoptive family. Unlike other forms of family building where you need, um, you know, uh, this is a very heteronormative uh, pathway to parenthood, of course, but you need sort of a biological mother and a biological father. In adoption, you need a third party, actually multiple third parties, and money must be paid and background checks um, conducted in order to put this family together. And so I argue that going up this unit of analysis is very informative to help us understand these larger questions about what makes a family. So here are sort of the three central research questions that are driving my work that I hope to touch on in the next you know, 45 minutes or so. Okay, so part of this has to do with this idea as that I come from a market perspective. And so what does this mean in terms of how can a market perspective help us? And I understand that with adoption, Bringing the word market to it can be somewhat tenuous in this idea that children are sacred. And I'll go over this a little bit more in depth in a few minutes. But the sense that, what does it mean to say, oh, a market for children? Usually that gives people this sort of sense like, ooh, I'm uncomfortable, you know, that we don't do that. You know, the sense of markets commodifying children harkens back to the brutal days of the slave trade where people had prices. And so for the longest time, that was very, anti-adoption talk. And in fact, there are lots of blogs and websites written by adoptive parents on how to handle these frankly inappropriate questions where people come up to you and say, ooh, how much does she cost? And that sort of idea that you don't ask those sort of things because you're not supposed to associate the exchange of money in a commodified nature with something as sacred as family building. But I want to challenge that a little bit to think about as sociologists, you know, we talk about labor markets, housing markets, how can we think about markets for family in a way? What's fruitful? What can we get out of this lens? And then what are the dangers and where should we pull back as well? The next question, what does adoption tell us about family? In this regard, like how can we use adoption as a lens of the thinking about family? And what does adoption tell us about race? So those are the three things that I plan to go over in the next 40 minutes. So let me tell you a little bit about the methods that I've been working through. Um, I am 
Wix Method Scholar, and so I kind of draw from multiple things. And so part of it I will talk about is the sort of analysis of the U.S. Census. In the year 2000, it was the first time that the U.S. Census actually differentiated between adoptive and step families. And so that gave us a really great sort of demographic opportunity to think, okay, what do we know at the national level about adoptive families? And part of my research agenda has been to look at that, and especially the heterogeneity <coughs> among adoptive families. And then, um, true to borrowing from Gottman, thinking about this idea of the front stage and the back stage, I've been trying to explore this tension between how is adoption, quote, marketed and sold to prospective parents. And so I've been um, observed, I was a participant observer at 40 adoption information sessions, which are not going to be the focus of most of what I'm talking about today. And then the sense of backstage, you know, how do adoption professionals present their work and their mission, what they do to audiences, prospective parents? And then how do they talk about their work one-on-one -on -one with someone like me who, as an adult adoptee and somebody who knows a lot about adoption, what do they say? And so today my focus is mostly going to be on the interviews, but I'll share some of the census results just to sort of give us the national picture. Okay. So back to this idea that markets permeate family formation and why there's some sociological mm, games to be looking at markets. And so part of this is the sense that we've got a long tradition in family sociology about thinking about the market perspective. So we've got Wilson and his supply of marriageable men in the sense about how do we explain the um, lower marriage rates among black women in a particular time in urban space. And this sense of assortative mating, and so this is really what I'm drawing on. Um, assortative mating, really this idea, okay, well if you put all partners romantic partners together, how do we figure out how they pair off? Now, of course, there are things like mutual attraction, shared values, that sociology is not so great at capturing, or at least to some degree at the, multi at the aggregate level. But yet, at the same time, I think that there's something very interesting about the demographics. And so people who have looked at this to say, how do things like race and education um, levels, welcome, how do those shape who gets matched with and so we see, you know, back to the know that race and education status, there was a really great recent review um, by Schwartz in 2016. And then we have assisted reproductive technology. And so we know it's not just partners, but it's also how people become parents. And so Renee Amelin has done a really fabulous ethnography about the market for human gametes for sperm and egg donors. And what she finds is that supply and demand really matters in terms of how things are left to be Sold. And so in a really sort of interesting flip from what I'll talk about in terms of racial markets and adoption, because women of color are so infrequent donors for eggs that the supply is less and so they actually command more. And so in some ways we don't have this idea that race is a static thing, but of course it's socially constructed and it's shaped by these ex um, exogenous factors like how much people, how much raw material there is and um, what the demand is for it. And so this idea that it can be fluid. <coughs> so this is sort of a long way of saying, you know, markets are a useful sociological lens. But of course, marketing children is a little bit special in this idea. It's a harder to do this, and especially because there's this sense of, well, children are sacred. So here I'm referencing Vivian Zelizer's work. She wrote a really great historical analysis called Pricing the Priceless Child. And so basically, there is a sense that child welfare practice is supposed to be immune to market forces, that market forces are somehow pernicious, that they contaminate the really pure social service that adoption was supposed to be. And then on the other hand, we have this sense that if there is a child market, and so um, Judge Lander, uh, Judge Posner and Elizabeth Landis wrote this book about maybe what we should do is we should have a purely rational marketplace where kids are almost auctioned off. And this was seen as sort of an anathema, that this is not where you want child welfare to be. And so how is it that you can navigate between what Vivian and Elizer calls these hostile worlds? That these are supposed to be so separate and never the two shall meet. But of course the reality in private adoption, and I'll go in a little bit in terms of what private adoption is versus other types of adoption, is that it's inescapable. And so if we know that money is going to change hands, that children are somehow, in order to actually be placed as child welfare, that to some degree they have to be 
turned, even if briefly, into objects first, and parents, in order to actually become parents, have to first become consumers to actually figure out, of all these streams, which child they're going to get. How do we sort of toggle between these things? And of course, so what I argue is that observing and learning from adoption practitioners gives us this missing link. Part of this, and this is very understandable, is that uh, prior work that's based off of adoptive parents, who are oftentimes asked a few years afterwards to sort of telescope back and think about their choices, they're much more likely to rely on narrative, uh, narratives of fate. There's this sense, maybe if you're familiar with the Chinese adoptive community, the red thread that's supposed to bind people indelibly, you know, between time and space, or the sense that the universe conspired to bring this, the love of their life, the light of their world to their family. And so, and that makes sense because very little of what I do actually looks at what happens post-adoption. There's a lot of really interesting work on there, but for myself, I was really interested in what happens beforehand when children are not living, breathing, whiny, after bedtime <laughs> beings, but, you know, these hypothetical sons or daughters, who could people imagine as family members? And so, in order to get that information, again, I argue that it's helpful to actually look at adoption practitioners, who together, you know, they can not only talk about just one case, but actually the aggregate of working with multiple, multiple families. Okay. So in order to do this, I want to do a little bit of adoption 101. I'm not sure in terms of your background, what you might know, but I think what I found from teaching my own classes in the family is that a lot of people think of adoption as sort of this universal family structure, and if they think of it at all. And yet, I think it's important to think about it in terms of market segments. So this is a little bit of adoption 101. Because there are actually, and some people might argue that there's more, but I think there are three main segments. The first one is called private adoption. And so private adoption can be the adoption of any child who was never born in the United States, who was not part of the foster care system, which I'll juxtapose in a moment. But usually in the adoption parlance, what we're talking about is for young infants. So the National Survey of Adoptive Parents found that the average age of children is about seven months old. But in reality, from my observations with adoption agencies, most of them go home, the babies, directly from the hospital. So these are young, young infants. So in order for us to think about market segments, I want us to think about child profile, different restrictions, because part of what I'm talking about, the sense of the sort of marketplace, I'll be talking about who has access to which segment and stream of adoption and the weights and the costs. So as I said, they're usually newborns. And then this is a really big change in domestic adoption, which I think is fueling some of the decision. Sort of this larger research question I have is sort of how are all parents in this sort of large pool widowed into one particular family? And part of this, if you're doing domestic, has to be this willingness to partake in open adoption. So this is a really big change. Uh, back in the day, uh, I once interviewed these social workers who said they had two separate elevators, one for the adoptive parents and one for the birth parents, and never the two shall meet. There was such an idea that you cannot have any contact. They had separate, structurally embedded elevators in their building in order to prevent this. But now, actually, um, open adoption is kind of the norm in domestic, and so that means that pregnant women occurs. There's a very specialized adoption language. Making an adoption plan actually gets to pick among profiles and choose the family. And so there is a little bit more empowering nature of open adoption. And then even in several states, in um, 38 of them, that after, they, um, especially the birth mother, relinquishes, relinquishes her maternal rights, she can still have in the decree sort of legal visitation that says, you know, pictures once a year and an annual meeting. The weights vary. Now, these are the parents who do the waiting. Anywhere from, you know, very fast is six months, but very long can be up to three years. And the costs range from about $10,000 to $40,000. As I will talk about later in the preview, there are really stark and grim racial differences in pricing. So when we think about sort of this idea of this sort of a marketplace, the price of a baby depends on the color of his or her skin. Okay, so international. It's, that's been changing as well. So we see that there are fewer babies, more toddlers, and school-aged children. Uh, now, often, too, what we're seeing is sort of this, um, the 
word, the term special needs is very sort of loose in adoption. It could be anything for waiting children who are older and so their seat is harder to place, they're part of a sibling group, and maybe some of them have known medical needs as well. And so it kind of runs the gamut. Um, it's very restrictive. Uh, there are really strong eligibility requirements, especially among some of the more popular countries. And so um, maybe like adopting from Korea, if one wanted to, there are certain um, very strict things, like you can't ever have been diagnosed with depression, you can't have any history of taking antidepressants, you have to be married. In China, there are certain body mass index requirements in terms of how one's body type is supposed to be, age and marriage, of course, but then there are lots of others. Gays and lesbians are not eligible, and so sometimes it's a little bit loose because there's this sense, too, that a lot of times gays and lesbians are still able to adopt, but they have to present themselves as single. And so it still does happen, but I can talk more about this during the Q&A if you want, but it's technically supposed to be off the table. Okay. Uh, different changing trends in waiting times, but for China, for the quote traditional program of a healthy Chinese infant girl, the waits are about six years now. And so again, this brings us back to this market idea that the parents are potentially lining up to adopt a child who supposedly is in need of a home, this is a child who has not been conceived by any matter shape. The biological parents may not have even met yet. <coughs> but yet there's something about China, and we will talk more about this, about a racially palatable young infant girl without no birth parents that makes the program pretty popular. Okay. And then I want to say that these two are called private adoption because they are not government subsidized, that the parents are pretty much paying most of the fees to cover everything, and this is a big shift from foster care. And so foster care, the children have been removed because of cases of abuse and neglect in the United States. And so unlike the other two where one could argue that the birth parents willingly relinquish their parental <coughs> rights, here the state takes them away, so that's a big difference. proactively recruit quote-unquote non-traditional families. It's the children, though, who do the waiting, that the average wait is about two and a half years for the child. That's once he, him or her is, um, or he or she is sort of declared free for adoption and then parental rights have been terminated. Sometimes it takes an additional two years. And of course, about 18,000 children a year are emancipated or age out of foster care as well. There's very little financial outlay for the parents. And actually, many, about 93% maintain what's called adoption subsidies. And so if they were foster parents before and the state had helped to sort of offset some of the costs associated with raising the child, those continue after adoption. Okay. So of course, the overarching thing that I want you to take away is that costs and waiting times, but these reflect differential demand for children. And not all parents have the same opportunity. So we have this sense of supply and demand and again, sort of the foundation of what I'm going to show is the sort of marketplace who gets matched with who. And as I mentioned, my focus is more on domestic and international, private adoption. Um, I don't look at foster care. Not right now, but maybe in a future project. Okay, so the sense of the business of adoption I want to talk about a little bit more in this regard of what does it mean to hear from social workers that talk about well, in private adoption, as hard as it is to necessarily say you know, we turn parents into consumers who have these choices, that's how business is done. So how is it um, that they talk about some of these things? So I wanted to share some quotes. And of course, one of the things that's really important for me to emphasize is that social workers that I've met, I have to confess, I like them so much more than I thought I would. <laughs> in this regard, I have so much more respect for what they do and the real questions that they try to juggle in this sense. And so some of them are clearly quite torn between their role and their desire. I mean, many of you know sociologists who are potentially interested in social work, public service work, doesn't pay very well. And so it's not like they're in it for the money. <coughs> that the sense that they want to be doing really good social service. And yet there's this conundrum because parents are paying these fees that they want this idea of customer service. So here's a quote from Aaron. In some ways, I feel like adoption takes on, versus other social service fields, 
almost a customer service component. These families that want to adopt, they come here and they want a baby, and they want, and they are paying fees for a variety of services. It almost comes in a way, in an exchange, that if you were doing other types of social work, it doesn't come up as much. And so, the sense about being customer service representatives, as well as doing social service, there's a pretty interesting tension there. And especially what I would call a down market place. And this is um, essentially the case in private international adoption, which I'll talk about in a minute. And so someone said this idea that as the number of young, healthy babies available via international adoption slowed down, a lot of people had a lot of trouble, quote, staying afloat. And someone said, if we weren't making referrals, and basically we have cash coming in when we make referrals because that's what we charge for all of our program services. So it's not like we weren't busy, we just didn't have any children to refer. So it was like, we need babies so we can make money, which is a horrible way to look at it, but that's the reality of how you keep your doors open in adoption. And so here's this sense, too, about this struggle. You know, what can a market perspective help us understand? It's this sort of backstage look of how was adoption done? Because that is really going to be the central <coughs> foundation for how does that play into our conceptions of family and to our conceptions of race for where I'm going in the future? So this idea that adoption operates, private adoption operates as a marketplace. Okay. So this next question, what can adoption tell us about family? So again, hopefully which was evident in terms of looking at this idea of segmented markets is that private adoption for the longest time was the venue for getting young, youngish, relatively healthy babies. And so young children really being the crux of this sense of what it means to come into a family. And in some ways more than race. And so in this regard, we're talking about the changing supply. So before Roe versus Wade, one out of 10 unmarried white women relinquished their children for adoption, so prior to 1972. Now it's fewer than one in 100 for women, regardless of any race. And so there's a real sort of downturn, if you will, in the supply of healthy babies available via the domestic market segment. But there's also been this downturn in international markets as well. But I argue that there's a growing demand. And as sociologists who study the family, many of us would argue that these are really great things in terms of the fact that there's um, now more room for highly educated women to delay fertility until <laughs> further on um, with their educations. And so yet, that I sense of like, oh, well, you know, women can have it all with the real limitations of biology and the aging egg. And so certainly women over 35 are the fastest growing segment of those who are giving birth, but at the same time it becomes harder and more difficult. And certainly as a woman in my late 30s, I've seen a lot of friends go through what I would say multiple miscarriages, failed rounds of IVF, how many more times can you mortgage your house, dig into your retirement in order to create that family. So I'm not even though as a sociologist, my job in the aggregate is to be critical and to try to make sense of these things, I don't want to diminish the individual narrative of how frustrating and hard it is to become a family, to make a family. People who I know who have had adoptions fall through, multiple miscarriages, that individually my heart breaks for them. And yet, I think at the aggregate, there's something fruitful to think about sociologically. There's greater support for, quote, non-traditional families, single mothers by choice, um, same-sex couples, but yet biological reproduction for same-sex couples is not going to form a baby. So certainly maybe two women, they have their two uteruses that perhaps you could get a sperm donor, but for two men, you either have surrogacy or adoption. So we have the sense there's a growing demand, but at the same time, people have more consumer choices. So one thing that's interesting to think about this sort of adoption, but within the larger spectrum of assisted reproduction, reproductive technology choices. All right. So there's been a downturn, as I mentioned, so I wanted to show you a quick graph from the US Department of State. So the heyday of international adoption really peaked in 2004, with almost 23,000 <coughs> Of those, 78% were children under two years old. So there's this, again, this sense that international adoption 
for a period of time really provided a fruitful venue for people who are eager to become parents of youngish, healthy children. So new low, um, this is 2014 data, 6,441 placements, but the data came out and it's like 5,700, so it's decreasing every year. And it's also this changing demographic. You've got 45% were under two years old at the time, too. So not only do you have fewer in general, but also fewer of those healthy infants. There's later on, I can talk a little bit in the Q&A if people are interested about sort of who these new adoptive parents are for sort of taking up the slack, but um, it's not the central focus of my work. So babies are this market priority. And so here's this sort of sociological thing. What does it tell us about family? that to come into a family that the youngest child seems to have the most, what Sarah Doro calls that clean slate without baggage who can be incorporated into the family. And so Nora said, people want babies. It has to do with getting as close as you can to replicating it. Adoption needs to follow what was often called the as if begotten model. I mean, certainly some of the structural practices in adoption sort of harken back to this idea that it's supposed to mimic biological reproduction. When parents adopt, the birth certificate is changed from wiping out the names of the biological parents to the adoptive parents. And so there's a growing movement for adoptees who would like access to their original birth certificates. But those are usually sealed before the courts. And so, I mean, even this idea that the birth certificate now has the adoptive parents, it's sort of Again, it's this idea of adoption is like birth. Um, from Danielle talks about the sense of <coughs> desire for a baby. There's a lot of focus on where can they get a baby. There are not babies available for international adoption like there were 10 years ago, kind of back in the heyday. And then we see this from the websites as well as talking about not only are there fewer babies, but there are fewer white babies. And so one of the things I want to say is sociologists of race is that in adoption, the word Caucasian is sort of the norm for whiteness. And so when I write about it, I use white, but when I'm talking with them, I use the sense of the word Caucasian. Hopefully, if some of you have taken classes about race and ethnicity, you know that the root of the word Caucasian comes from this idea of the people from Caucasia, the most beautiful race of man. And so, but I think that in parlance, a lot of times people think Caucasian is polite for white, that, you know, Instead of saying black, African-American is a polite word, and Caucasian becomes the other one. But, um, so I use the word Caucasian when I talk to social workers because that's what they use a lot in their websites and their materials, but I did want to sort of juxtapose that with what I think is um, kind of an outdated and misguided term for whiteness. All right, so this comes from one of adoption agency websites. This, again, is the, the shortage of white infants. Currently, there are less available Caucasian infants than there are families requesting to adopt them, so they limit them. Therefore, we will not be accepting applications for our Caucasian adoption programs for those who are able to conceive a biological child. So white babies are reserved for those who are the most disturbing. But this is what they follow up. However, there is a need for families for African American children in the U.S. and many international programs that allow families for children for children to adopt. So again, I want to bring up this idea that in adoption, encoded structurally, not only in the wording of the websites, but later on I'll talk about some of the pricing, we see this racial hierarchy. So this is sort of the seeds of that next question, what can adoption tell us about race? A little bit more in terms of who are the main sending countries for our adoption. Um, we've got in order China, Russia, Guatemala, Korea, and Ethiopia. There's been a big change. China now has pretty much slowed down, big six, eight year wait. Russia has closed. But even before that woman in 2012, maybe you remember the story, returned her adopted son on a one way ticket to Russia. And then further, Putin decided that he was going to outlaw it. The numbers had dropped significantly anyway. Guatemala is on hold and essentially closed. Korea has now said 378 compared to the height of 2,000 children back in the day, and Ethiopia. So we've got this really big decrease. But at the same time, these were very popular programs because they sent young infants. So Guatemala, what is this? 92% were younger than two at the time. They were sending about 5,000, 6,000 children a year. Korea, 98%. And this is sort of a national average. It was about 74%. And total about 184,000 children it's over this 15 years. So this last question, you know, how can, what can 
adoption tell us about race? How does this fit into the racial hierarchy? So I want to talk a little bit about some prior research on interracial families and the color line. Sociologists have a long-standing tradition about using intermarriage as an indicator of racial boundaries going back to Gordon in 1964. And there's this idea that if two people from um, different races you know, were able to form a union and to marry, and that one, it showed that there had been an erosion of the color line, and then second, that their multiracial children as well would be the next step. So there is a generational engine between us in terms of thinking about racial assimilation. We know that the rise of uh, interracial marriage is on the rise. One out of seven new marriages are interracial or interethnic, ethnic in this case being how we sort of mark Hispanics as an ethnicity and not a race, so a white person and a white Hispanic would technically be an inter-ethnic marriage. Um, but we also know that interracial marriages are more likely between whites and Hispanics and whites and Asians than between whites and blacks. And so this sense of the color line, what does this mean? A lot of sociologists of racial ethnicity have been thinking about this in terms of, especially post-1965, the Hart Seller Act, which sort of opened up the floodgates for Asian immigrants who were pretty much barred from the Chinese Exclusion Act, and as well as sort of um, legalizing the pathway for Hispanic immigrants. And so there's been a real question, well, how are these sort of new, but they're not so new before, because it's been 50 years now since Hart Seller, but how do we make sense of this? And so what people are arguing is that whereas the U.S., back when Gordon was looking at it, was very much between the sense of a white not white divide, and so under that regard, interracial marriage was a very noticeable and fruitful lens that we are, might be moving to a black, non-black divide. And I think that this is especially troubling to think about the larger racial discourse in the United States, especially in the sense of the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, where sort of, who has opportunities in the United States? And this is a deep and probing question that goes beyond, you know, my ability to look at, you know, just an adoption, but it's something that's very near and dear to me to think about. And so this sense, what can adoption tell us about the color line? Because I argue adoption serves as another indicator of racial and ethnic boundaries. Again, if you think about it, when people sort of meet and fall in love and decide to form a union and get married, although sociologists and the family know that marriage is kind of this blasé luxury good now assembly for high SES folk <laughs> anyway, and so that's sort of changing. So maybe marriage isn't the best indicator after all. But yet, the sense of when people choose the race of the child they're going to adopt, and that's usually done in conjunction with many other market variables, but they're actually kind of writing down who would they consider as a son or daughter. And again, remember that this is a hypothetical thing, so descriptive variables like race, age, and health, gender, might mean a lot more than saying in the sense of like, I'm going to throw caution to the wind and I'm in love, you know, versus I want a hypothetical child that I can see as a son or a daughter. And so in this sense, adoption serves as this indicator of racial and ethnic boundaries. So according to the women that interviewed, and they were all women, you know, pretty likely for a social work, um, thinking about, you know, how is the color line demarcated? Sarah told me, she's an adoption attorney, I would say that most of our clients are white. And not all, we definitely have African American and Hispanic clients, but I would say the vast majority of them are white. And most of them are hoping to adopt a white child or a white Asian child or a white Hispanic child. So again, this sense of how, according to adoption social workers who work with multitudes and multitudes of prospective adoptive parents, most of whom are white, how is it that these white prospective adoptive parents consider the color? Sylvia, the adoption counselor during my interview, um, was talking to me and she said, as I'm sure you know, there are lots of stereotypes around Asians. So again, I'm thinking about this sense, maybe Asians and to a lesser extent have Hispanics are what Eduardo Benio Silva uh, calls honorary white folk. Asians are preferable to African American and Latino. They are sort of lower down. There is a pecking order. And so this idea about how is that pecking order, how is that racial hierarchy or color line how is it reflected and at times potentially contested in adoption? All right, so I can show you a little bit in terms of some of the work I did at the US, um, with US Census data. This sense, you know, it is transracial adoption colorblind. Part of the work and the larger sort of goal of my research is to somewhat complicate this narrative of that in adoption, 
love sees no color. And I think that, again, as the individual family member, and of course my job is to sort of toggle between this sense of the micro level, and I will be quite frank in disclosing my own social location. I mean, I grew up in a transracial adopted family. I'm adopted from Korea, my brother's adopted from India, my sister's white, my parents' biological child, and my parents, you know, are both white. Is that I see that love sees no color at the micro. But yet, at the macro, when we sort of aggregate all these things and how individual choices can help reflect these larger social patterns, I think that there's value in that. And so I'm thinking about the sense, is transracial adoption colorblind? So one of the big things to take away, ooh, that's weird. Um, whoa, that's different from what I can see there. Um, OK, that's OK. I'll just throw it. Um, so, 82% of white adopted parents adopt a child of the same race. And so this is pretty important when we think about uh, that we say, you know, white parents are disproportionately the most likely to be adopted parents, first of all, and as well as to adopt across the color line. But we're only talking about a subset of them. I will tell you that when black adopted parents decide to adopt, 19 out of 20 times they adopt a black child. And so part of this might have to do with the sense of supply like which children are available versus for white parents who, again, there's that shortage of white infants. But when they do adopt, they are much more likely to adopt Hispanic or Asian children. So if you broke out those 18% of white adoptive parents and which race child they adopt, they adopt Hispanic, Asian, to a lesser extent though, more than one race, and then of course black. And so if we think about this pecking order showing up, we see it in people's choices, but I think perhaps more disturbing, we see it institutionalized in people's adoption choices. So here we go. Um, I mentioned there are racialized fees. This is one agency which I will call Baby Talk. And so they have, you know, the sense, of, and they all do have crazy funny names like that, so I'm not too far <laughs> All right, so total home study fee, you got $4,000. And so a lot of these, and again, the color of my income, their fees are for, for their traditional program, are for any, non-black child. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. And the program fee is $12,700. The placement fee is $22, so we bring this up to almost 40 k Then they have another program for called African American Family Fees. And so this isn't a sliding scale for people who necessarily might be African American, as we know from demographically, who overall might have less money, but yet, you know, this is in terms of any parent who wants to adopt a black baby, this is what it costs. You've got 19,500, half the discount, what I call the dark skin discount. And so this should hopefully make you a little bit uncomfortable in this idea, you know, if we think about love sees no color, and yet this very, what I call color explicit policies that are embedded in adoption too, I think really sort of underscore that this idea that somehow ignoring the color line doesn't make it go away, it just pushes it underground. Maybe some of you were familiar with NPR's The Race Card Project, you know, Code Switch. This came out a couple years ago, you know, black babies cost less to adopt. And all this sort of did is it sort of brought attention to it, and now it's just much harder to find people's fee schedules online, which thank God that I was able to archive them earlier. Okay, so we have this sense too, and here I want to play around with some of these ideas about race that um, another agency, what they have too, is they call it their Caucasian Asian Hispanic program, which is like $22,000, and then their African American biracial program, which is 12 or something. And so again, this color line, instead of being white, non-white, we really see this institutionalization of the black, non-black divide. And yet too, this sense too of hypodescent and the one drop rule, that any child who is biracial who has a drop of black blood is automatically in this fees for African American and multiracial African American program. And so you see the color line and how would this set playing out in this way too. But yet it's slightly and disturbingly somewhat contested because some places they have sort of an in-between schedule too for people uh, for biracial mm -hmm. black. And here biracial, and I'm not necessarily meaning the way sociologists would count biracial, like a black Hispanic and a black parent to have the mixed race child. But instead, black in this, or biracial means sort of part African American, which brings us into it. And sometimes there's a mid-tier price for that as well. 
All right, so what I'm here and I'm showing you is this idea of the institutionalization of the colorblind. But yet, at the same time, going back, well, what does it tell us about family, too? This larger question of assortative adoption, who gets matched with whom? How does this all sort of fit together in terms of parents who might not have as much choice? And so part of this is so I've been really interested in asking adoption social workers, well, that's great now that we have this sort of larger societal support. Um, you might have heard Mississippi just was the last state to have a gay adoption law, and so they recently struck that down. But of course, then they passed that religious uh, preference law for gay marriages instead. So. You win and you lose, you know. Um, but part of this is this idea, too, about same-sex parents who are seen as having not as much choice or who are going to wait longer for their child. Patricia said, we definitely give them a different timeline. People are making adoption plans because a lot of times they are single. So they are not necessarily looking for a single parent for their child. And a lot of people are not open to same-sex lifestyle. Again, the sense of the profiles to an adoption lawyer says, you stand five profiles next to each other, three are heterosexual couples, and one of them is same-sex couple, and one of them is a single mom. A direct comparison puts them at a disadvantage, so they wait longer. Alyssa said, you know, some families know the odds, and they say, well, I should be open to all races because otherwise I'm never going to get chosen. So a social worker told me, and then again, this institutionalization of the color line, they have different books. The books being the profiles, families who are willing to be shown to a white woman giving birth to a white baby. And of course, the way we do race here, that's a very key difference between a woman who could be black or white giving birth to a black baby. You know, the way that the hypothesis and the biologicalization of race in this current social constructed moment, I think is pretty important to think about. And so in the white Caucasian book, they have like 100 profiles, and in the African, African American book, they have like, 30, maybe 15. And so in this way, too, there is a real sort of market calculation in terms of you know, who's going to get chosen. And so ultimately, what I argue is that transracial adoption becomes a market calculation. Patricia goes on to say, families realize that if they are open to a child of color, they are likely to get placed faster, and suddenly they would like to adopt a child of color, whereas it was never something they had considered doing before. But they found out, I'm only open to a Caucasian. I might wait two or three years, but if I'm open to African American, I could be placed in six months. Erica responds, it comes back to flexibility on race. We do see families who are limiting themselves to a child as healthy as possible, again, the color line, Caucasian or Hispanic, in a relatively close adoption. Realistically, they'll be waiting three plus years. So how does this play out at the end? And so what we've seen, you know, this idea not all parents have equal market aspect, um, equal access. And so part of it, as I mentioned before, about 18% of white adoptive parents adopt across race. And so what does this mean in terms of family structure? And so those who are married, we've got, you can tell from the census, same-sex couples, single, never married folk, so those who weren't necessarily divorced, you know, married at the time, and then divorced. And who adopts across race? And what we see is that we've got same-sex and single parents, single, never married, who are the most likely of the white adopted parents. And this, I want to say, is an important thing to think about because there is this sort of idea that same-sex couples, because they're used to being, unfortunately, marginalized because of their sexual orientation, might be more likely to be sort of socially liberal and be open to adopting a child of color. But yet, I also think that there are structural aspects involved in terms of what type of children, forgive me, can people get? And sort of, so with married couples, married heterosexual white couples adopt, they adopt Asian Hispanic. And yet, for singles and never, um, single, never married and same sex, they are slightly more likely to adopt black children. But also, when they do adopt, again, they're looking at the color line for Hispanic and Asian children. All right. So among white parents, same-sex and single parents are the most likely to adopt across race. And this brings me you know, to the sense of this sort of adoption, this idea about who gets matched with whom. We've got child selection driven by a racial color line and parent selection driven by uh, family structure. And who gets matched with whom is sort of this larger idea of what I'm looking at in terms of how, and again, this is not something, you know, it's pretty, 
mean, how do you expect a dolphin to be this happy human interest story? What I'm really talking about, of course, is inequality of choice and many of the things that you were all very nuanced and sophisticated enough to come up with at the very beginning. And to think about this in terms of family inequality, who's seen as a lower tier adoptive parent and who's seen as a lower tier kid? Okay, so to recap, when I've got this idea of this market framework, private adoption is influenced, but of course not reduced to market principles. And this creates tension for adoption providers between the sense of being customer service and social service. For family, the healthy baby is the centerpiece. Of course, there are parents who are willing and eager and excited to adopt older children, whether it be internationally or for foster care, but they are much fewer and further between. And frankly, if they're going to, most of the time, you would expect rationally that they would adopt through foster care because you know, those children oh, do not, the financial outlay is not nearly as much. And so people who are open to adopting older kids oftentimes do not use private adoption. And race becomes a variable that some people are willing to flex on to adopt, but as I argue in my larger work, there are limits to flexibility in terms of this idea of those honorary white, non-white but non-black children. So transracial adoption helps give us a window into the color line. And that we see, unfortunately, the adoption of a black child is positioned and priced and instituted very differently than adopting an Asian or Hispanic child. So what can we get from this? What are our conclusions here? And again, I'm really trying to play with your sense that adoption is often this oversimplified human interest story. Maybe, and I'm getting old, and so Angelina Jolie and the cover from Us Weekly are nearly as the same traction as they were five <laughs> years ago. But maybe some of the first words that you thought about with adoption were celebrities. Oh. And then there's a shift in conversation as well. And so, of course, the micro, you know, adoption, not altruistic, but it's sort of this idea of <laughs> a, a good thing, you know. Um, what's the word? That the intention, you know, the ends justify the means. It might be a little bit murky about how things are made, but at the same time, the children are happy and thriving, and the parents are thrilled, which is oftentimes the case, is what the research shows, until they get older, but I digress. Um, <laughs> and then for racial adoption, you know, that asked white parents to mark their own version of the color line. And so this is an important sociological thing for us to think about. But yeah, I think that there are implications here, and so this is where I'm going to so how do we juxtapose this idea that love sees no color with the stark descriptions? Uh, not only in the pricing, but a lot of times during the information sessions, I found these very what I call you know, colorblind, color explicit tensions. People are saying, oh, whatever's going to be best for your family. Then later on, you say, careful, some of these kids are darker than you would assume. You're adopting from Colombia, like don't forget there are Afro, Afro, Afro Colombian children there. They're going to be darker. If you're going to Peru, the skin tone ranges from blank. I mean, these are like verbatim quotes that I'm getting from adoption social workers who are trying to warn parents don't forget if you're in Russia, it juxtaposes Asia, so some of them might look a little Asian. So, how is it that we can sort of make sense of this tension, this juxtaposition? And especially in a down market where there's provider competition, this is sort of the child welfare piece that gives me pause to think in terms of agencies that relax their guidelines, the short trainings, because they don't want to do more, ask more from parents, because they parents who understandably, especially if they've been waiting a pretty long time, can vote with their feet and say, I'm going to go to the top. Other agencies can give me the same type of process for cheaper and a little bit faster. And I don't blame them that terms of that consumer choice. And so what we see is this sort of lowering of the bar. And so if transracial adoption becomes this market calculation, the agencies are hesitant to actually put forth the training that parents might need in order to implement this for the best interest of the child, which adoption is supposed to be. You know, how is it that, um, how is this going to relate to as children grow up? This is a really great body of research that sort of questions this idea, even for those quote unquote honorary white children who are Hispanic and Asian, who as they come of age, of course, face their own nuanced complexities of growing up a transracial family. Sorry. Right. So thank you all very much.
the decrease in the price a consequence of not the value of the African American baby, but the perception that African American parents don't have the resources, they don't have $40,000 to spend, so that they really construct this around how do they create greater opportunity for African American parents, right. yet it also simultaneously becomes a devaluing of the child. So that's a really good question. And so a couple of the things, like oftentimes when I interview social workers, they said, you know, well, black children are quote, quote, part of the place. And so because of that, in order to encourage the end goal of placing children who need parents and permanent families, we try to create a pathway to do that. But yet I would say that if they wanted to do that, then potentially one thing they could do is have a sliding scale fee for parents and sort of to open up this sense that, well, you know, if you think adopt, like all children need families, then maybe we can do it a sliding scale. And so that would incorporate those who are lower SES, regardless of race as a way. Sure. But yet, oftentimes what they find is that, especially this is part of this sort of institutional racism and of private adoption and white privilege, is that what you see most of the time is you have social workers who are predominantly serving you know, I asked them to estimate well, what percent of your clients are white. Most of them are like, oh, 90, 95. And so without actually structurally doing things to sort of encourage black adoptive parents to apply, then it doesn't really, the pricing it sort of, it's sort of a secondary thing, but rather than the sort of the recruitment in general. Unlike foster care, who I think has done a much better job at finding those parents, it's been harder. So that's a good question. So I'm curious about how, and I don't know if this is something you've researched, but how to make sure that um, any you know, ethics are maintained in adoption, because I've heard about in Guatemala, and I think Paraguay as well, that there was, in probably other countries, but there was an adoption market going on where like pregnant women were being abducted and mm -hmm. things like that. So how, if like the adoption agencies are aware of that, or I don't know, somehow it didn't get connected to the parents that they're adopting a child who's technically kidnapped. So how, how does adoption international adoption take measures to stay out of the Sure, that's a really good question. There is something that was passed in, I forget the year, I think the late 1990s, early 2000s, called the Hague Convention on the Rights of the Child. Mm -hmm. And so part of this was supposed to be in the US signed on as a signatory that there are these um, guidelines in place that are supposed to sort of help against child trafficking. And so that's mm -hmm. one reason why the US um, Guatemala signed on to the Hague, but they didn't have actually anything in place, and so that's why adoptions from Guatemala kind of fell apart. And frankly, in the cost of it, left a lot of families who were in process, who some of them had already accepted what's called the referral of a child, who had this picture that they placed their hopes and dreams on of a son and daughter, who was technically now told, you know, that the U.S. would not issue an adoption visa for. I think that's one of the big questions. A lot of people come from this with very different sense. Elizabeth Bartlett and the child Adopt, international adoption is a human rights issue. There's an ar argument that says we should not throw out the baby with the bathwater, so <laughs> to speak. That if things are, adoption will always invite a few bad apples, which we really want to change the life chances of other children, especially when their parents here. And then there are others who say, well, at the same time, there's a sense that by having such a huge sort of motivation and sort of, of course the US dollar is pretty strong and so I was interviewing someone who said, well he's giving a government official $20 for gas in Ethiopia, is that a bribe? Is this corruption or is that just sort of how things happen? And of course part of it is that if the average income in a year in Ethiopia is $500, that $12,000, $14,000 placement fee, you know, suddenly has a lot more, forgive me, bang for the buck in this regard. And so, I mean, I think that this has been sort of the big question, and so this is partially why adoption is closing down, that people are getting savvier about child trafficking. And it's not just the agencies, it's the parents, too. I mean, very, most of them, you know, they don't want to be anywhere involved with a process, I would think, where their child could have been potentially trafficked. But what happens oftentimes, David Smolin is a really great advocate, he calls it slash and burn. And so what we see with adoption is that these countries, they become huge, sort of um, blockbuster sending countries, if you will. China at its height was sending 8,000 children just 
to the U.S. I mean, China's got a billion people, and so the per capita. Guatemala, one out of a um, hundred Guatemalan-born babies was sent to the United States for adoption at its height. I mean, so this is demographically a pretty large percentage. And yet, at the same time, you know, months that people, I, a social worker once said, a country can only sustain so many families, but you have families who are lining up, and especially if you've got this sense of this greater demand that who want a baby, potentially and partially driven to international adoption for complex reasons that part of it is the sense that, well, maybe children in the U.S. already have a chance. There are people competing for white babies that I don't necessarily need to compete for one, that I want to give a child at home. Of course, a young, healthy infant child without known ties to birth parents, that particular demographic. And those children are oftentimes less and less available. And so I think what happens is that they haven't really figured out how to do it. Basically, a country just goes like Ethiopia for a while, and then it sort of implodes upon itself. And we do this over and over again. Yes. Do you have, uh, you said the uh, peak of international adoption was around 2007 Four. or four? Yeah. At 23,000, and now it's around 5,800? Yep. So as a marketplace analysis, where do you think we're going to be 10 years from now? Will that, that mm -hmm. be such a low threshold that that becomes intolerable and then there's ways right. to bring well, in other countries? Lots of places have closed. And mm -hmm. so someone called it a quote, perfect storm on their website that they had to close because they need babies to make money and there aren't enough. I think what we're seeing is surrogacy, honestly. And so, and that brings up a whole other host of issues. But I, I think that the heyday of adoption is decreasing in terms of international. There will always be some, and there's a large growing um, evangelical movement to adopt orphans, and so I think that the profile of parents is changing. Those who are adopting, of course, now but most of the children are older, and that brings up a whole other host of issues and concerns, but at the same time, it's not necessarily the same sort of young, healthy infant that's driving it. I think domestic is what you're seeing in greater amounts, but people are still very, afraid, if you will, of birth parents. And again, I have to, you know, socially locate myself. I speak from a place of privilege. You know, I'm I'm a mother by a child, and I have a biological child who is the racial mix of myself and my partner. And so in this regard, who came to be, but I could claim from birth and even prior in terms of gestation. And so because of that, I understand that the fear potentially of trying to make room for somebody else who wants to show up at you know holidays and birthdays with cards and that sort of thing. And so, but I, I think that more and more people are moving to domestic adoption, which in some ways it brings the birth parents out of the shadows and hopefully more empowered members. But at the same time, I do feel like, you know, I'm sure that you will find a handful of very autonomous, empowered with pregnant women who are who choose adoption, but most of the time the women who choose adoption, like choice is a, Ricky Solinger talks about, it's sort of a fake word in some of the ways in terms of the choices that people have, especially low SES women. Yeah. Looking at this through a marker perspective, when you look at commodity, right, mm -hmm. well, there is just a lot of surplus value than the right. cost to make it, right? right? Well, through a marker perspective, how much does it cost to make an international adoption available? Because there are at least $20,000. I mean, part of it is that one of the things I almost wish, going back to Landis and Foster, that women who, it's funny that everybody else makes money except off of the women, but we don't, as a society, you know, there are caps of how much pregnant women can make, you know, how much money can support the adoption. Of course, they're never supposed to make any money off of it, but different states have different levels. Like, oh, the last two months of pregnancy, it can support potentially rent, and maybe, you know, they try to get um, women, infants, and children for WIC, so the adoptive parents don't have to pay the prenatal care associated. But money can change hands, but they don't want anything. A lot of places say, you know, one agency, they have a special birth mother support fund. So in addition to all those program fees, adoptive parents are asked to pay $3,000 to a general support fund, and the agency allocates fees as they deem necessary. So they say we don't want any hint of baby buying. And so in this regard, you know, um, for young, healthy infants, I mean, there's this idea at International that there could be, I have a hard time. I know that there for women, especially one China program, stigma against single moms, poverty, but there are a lot of women who need international adoption. But at the same time,
time, I also know that there are people going out into villages called harvesting orphans. You know, giving people who don't necessarily have a real sense of what adoption is, that the sense that maybe their kids are going to come back, their parents are going to send them money, you know. There are lots of questions for me in terms of how corruption, and I'm not saying that international adoption is totally corrupt. I don't believe that. But at the same time, but I don't really know. That's a good question in terms of what the money, basically, these aren't like people who have stockholders. They're just trying to pay their overhead and the salaries of social workers. But you know, the business model that was framed upon, you know, back in the heyday, it has dried up. So that's sure. sort of the best I can do. That's a good question. <laughs> Noticing when you were talking about social workers dealing with customer service mm -hmm. and attention, um, because it's a marketplace, it's customer service to mm -hmm. the customer who's right. the parent, mm -hmm. which means all the focus seems to be on taking care of the parent's mm -hmm. needs, and the focus is less toward taking care of the needs of the children, mm -hmm. or even, <laughs> as you're alluding to here, the needs of the birth parent mm -hmm. or parent. Sorry. Uh, I, I don't know that that is a question, but maybe, maybe you could just. So one of the things in that, I didn't have time for today that I really do try to tease this out a little bit more in this sense that of all of the adoption information sessions that I went to, that the premise is that you know we exist for the best interest of the children, and so for those in the room who are, um, you know, I really draw on this idea of um, Hostile's work of emotion work, and so by putting on this sense of we're going to put it out there that, of course, everything we do is at the best interest of the child, so you can trust us on this. Now I'm going to pivot to talking about your interests and needs as consumers, and especially knowing that people can walk with their feet. And so, again, people who adopt, I can understand that they would want to know, okay, so this is all done, as someone quoted, on the up and up, that this is all in the best interest of children. They say the child is the client. But the child as the client is a paradox of private adoption because the children first of all, are kind of hypothetical. They're out there, they haven't been matched yet, they haven't been conceived. And then the parents pay all of the fees as well in private adoption. And so by saying one parent, or one social worker at an informational information session said, oh, you know, it's really important that we consider the child the client, the central client. But of course, we want to help you as much as we can as well. And so again, there I think there's this emotion work by saying, okay, we're going to set the foundation, and don't worry, this is all in the up and up, the child is the client, and now because of that, we want to pitch this as fit. And so one of the things that I talk about is the sense of the euphemisms, especially surrounding race and choice that get thrown around, in terms of how people want to say, like, you know, you have to find the best fit for your family, what's going to be right for you. And so of course what they're really meaning is this toggling between open versus closed adoption, younger versus older, you know, a child with no medical needs versus someone as healthy as possible, and then skin tone and shade, especially for white parents, who people see as their son or daughter, and how do all those things come together? Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of wondering, if, and this could possibly be outside of your research, um, so definitely let me know, but um, is there research right now like surrounding uh, the child's identity and being raised by white parents, mm -hmm. um, because I've had a few conversations with some people who were who were adopted and they are people of color. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, one of them was Latino, mm -hmm. and one struggle that they went through is they didn't have, um, they weren't able to experience the cultural and like they didn't speak Spanish, so they were ostracized by their own community, which they tried to identify with, and then they also didn't look white, mm -hmm. so they were so. I'm kind of wondering. So there's a growing number of research. And so I think it depends on <laughs> some of the earliest things in the 80s were done oftentimes by you know, adoptive parents. So I think have a different perspective from the Rita J. Simon, a bunch of others who weren't necessarily looking for nuance, so to speak. But I think also because the idea of being conspicuous, I mean, this is years before Modern Family came out, right? Like the <laughs> sense that, or Angelina Jolie. <laughs> Uh, that people, like, it was still very stigmatized. And so I think there was a sense that they wanted to affirm these families' places. And now as the research has gotten more, 
you know, as any field, as it just sort of builds upon itself. Um, there's a lot of really great look, work in terms of the sense of racial socialization. Part of it is the sense that now as we have cohorts of adult adoptees, you know, from Korea, especially first, now we're seeing more from China. I think that you will see the Guatemalans start to speak for themselves a little bit more as you know, they're all so young, you know, back in 2003, 2002. So we have to kind of wait for them to come of age and to make sense of it. Um, someone named Heather Jacobson does this really great thing about the sense of culture keeping too, about the ways in which the general norm for international adoptive parents is to sort of send their kids to culture camps, these sort of external things that are a day or two, um, a year. I, I used to go to them when I was younger, you made a flag, you know, you ate some kimchi, you used chopsticks. <laughs> but what I do with my own students is, did you might, you might not know that last year, 93 student, uh, American babies were sent abroad for adoption. And so this idea of the US not being not only a receiving country, but a sending country as well. So I would challenge them to think, all right, now imagine, you know, they're sent to Canada. Canada wants to have a culture camp for these kids to teach them American <laughs> culture. <laughs> they what exactly cowboy <laughs> hats? I don't even know. I mean, so, but of course that kind of means humorous because, well, how can you boil down culture into like a one day sound point? You know, what would you do with this? Um, you know, serve a hot dish or something. So, you know, what is it? culture? Is it necessarily food? Are you going to teach them some, they have Pledge of Allegiance, you know, are those the sort of things that, you know, and as sociologists, of course, we can laugh because that's a very boiled down, simplified view, but oftentimes, and this is sort of the sense too, that I think that that's what's accessible to parents who are trying, and at least they're trying, but we see that sometimes, you know, there's some really great work that's like beyond culture camp, but those things are not enough. But yet, I think, again, going back to the structural view is that agencies, um, I mean, they get all their money to do the adoption. And so there's not enough for like post-adoption services. I mean, that's a real problem. And so unless parents are like savvy enough and that's frankly, you know, wealthy enough to be able to afford that and they're willing to put their money there instead of um, music lessons, you know, soccer, all those other things that parents do, middle class kids are supposed to be doing right now in this very net row. Um, concerted cultivation model, you know, if they're willing to put their money there, um, maybe agencies will do things, but it's all, again, very money driven. Good question. Yeah. Um, I just, uh, I have a question about family preservation. Mm -hmm. um, do you see any, like, a movement in the um, adoption agency or fees or among uh, social workers to kind of promote, um, not promote, but mm -hmm. that they have to be called orphans to get a visa. And so the thing is, is that, of course, the, these are not children whose parents died in a car crash, you know, the, in terms of the sense of social orphans. And so they've been sort of given this legal orphanhood. And so by the point that the parents, the prospective adoptive parents line up, these children are supposed to be free for adoption, like legally, without, they're supposed to be legal orphans. Uh, what I found among the adoption social workers is really interesting Tension. Many of them, especially in domestic, because their job was to toggle between less about the child and more between the birth parents, and many of them were strong advocates. Someone told me that several of them said, you know, I just had a family, this was like, you know, post-Great Recession, that said, who would come in, and she said, this is not the right thing for you. Adoption is a permanent solution, and you've got a very temporary problem. What you probably need is unemployment, you need, maybe need, like, you know, traditional aid for needy families, whatever it's called now, you know. Um, and so because of that, and she said, you know, adoption is not going to be for you. But yet, at the same time, they also have, you know, in their domestic adoption, a lot of independent attorneys might say, oh, I want you to get to the pregnant woman they're working with, options counseling, so you can see, but they're not going to push it in the same way. Their job
job, and attorneys are at least more honest about it. Their job is to represent their client, who is, you know, they bill several hundred dollars an hour or two and they put that money in escrow. And so they're not there to represent the child, the birth mother um, slash pregnant woman. But I mean, one of the things that I think adoption is about access and choice is that there's not a lot of advocacy, I think, for a pregnant woman at the time. And certainly, you know, it, the whole sense that international adoption is a child welfare option, but parents, you know, they want to pay, they're willing to pay $30,000 to transfer the rights of this child, which would potentially help the child in the long run. But of course, those parents, understandably, aren't paying $30,000, you know, to charity to sort of help those kids. You know, they, they want a family, they want a child. How are we going to have time? We have time for just one more okay. question. No pressure. <laughs> I can stick around too. You look like you want to okay. Yeah. So um, one of your quotes alluded to this. So birth mothers or pregnant women get to look at profiles <laughs> of which perspective of parents. And so I was wondering, you mentioned there's sort of like tiers of prospective parents in addition to the tiers of raising of the children. So, you know, like the ideal is, of course, the married couple, and then you have, you know, painted <coughs> couples and single mothers. Uh, I was wondering if there is any research done, maybe, like, are the, are the agencies sort of creating that, where, like, they show several <coughs> white, you know, white married couples and then the others, or is that, or is that the personal choice of running community about that? Okay. So it depends. People, I asked about sort of this, because I'm very curious how it was done, and so this is a great question. Different agencies have different practices. Smaller groups, anybody who's cleared for their home studies, or their all, I mean, this is a hard process. Background checks, letters of recommendation, clearances, who are sort of ready to be shown, depending, they oftentimes fill out this profile piece. So it's not only about race, but things like, are you willing to um, consider a child if we're the pregnant woman, you know, use marijuana all three trimesters, uh, who has a history of bipolar or maybe depression, is on methadone maintenance, you know, a lot of different ideas. And so that sort of shapes who gets matched. And then people, I ask, like, how they manage the queue. Sometimes I just kind of put them all out there and say, here, you know, out of the 30 people, if you're a white woman, you probably got 20, uh, depending on your health history, 20, 25 profiles, and they look through them. Sometimes I try to manage it, and they put the people who are waiting the longest in the front. And so that way they'll kind of look through and see. Other times, people will give them three and ask them if they needed more. And again, people who have been waiting the longest, they would be among those three. Sadly, you know, what I've seen, if you go through, like, adoptimists, that oftentimes, you know, for um, darker skinned, you know, in terms of Hispanic and black children in the U.S., because there are very few Asian children for via domestic adoption, like half of 1% of domestic adoptees are Asian. Um, so because of that, you know, you have this sort of these different ideas. One thing I will tell you, though, this is sort of this interesting idea, though, for domestic adoption, which uh, I didn't know, and I'll leave you with this sense, is that sometimes two men do better in the adoption market for domestic adoption, especially if there's an open adoption, because the birth mom gets to still be the mom. Mm -hmm. And so there are these sort of interesting ideas, too, about the way that family structure and status sometimes work out in ways that you wouldn't necessarily. I can stick around, but thank you all.